Welcome everyone, Costine here with a discussion about some of the best campaigns in Total War, Warhammer, Free Immortal Empires that sh you should play at least once. With the implication that these campaigns are not necessarily the best to play over and over and over again, but playing them at least once is certainly worth it because it can be a pretty fun experience. Once or twice, figure things out, then do a full campaign as these legendary lords. At number 5, we have Prince Emric of Kalador, the High Elves. The High Elves are certainly a powerful race, but Emric has a lot of limitations in his campaign because it's just going to take him time to establish trading partners because every faction around him doesn't like him. However, when all is said and done, there's something quite interesting about playing Emric in multiple ways. He has several landmarks next to him in his capital, in the Bone Gulch, and then in Bitter Bay as well. Well, there's also the Nagash one over here, but there's a downside with, with that. And he also starts in the newly remade Darklands, and there's a lot of potential over here in this particular area. He also has access to quite a few terrain types, mountains, wastelands. He doesn't have access to Frozen, unfortunately, in his campaign, but outside of that, he can at least take hold over all of Wolf 1. So, Emric does have quite a bit of potential in his campaign, and his faction effects, focusing on dragons, and in particular, getting those super powerful dragons, are really uh, powerful. Not as good as what, say, Tyrion or Leifanar or Alariel do have, or even Alfarian potentially, but still pretty powerful all the same. Emric himself has a good amount of campaign movement range. He's immune to mountain and desert attrition, and he has a minus 25% upkeep for dragons and dragon princes. He also gets quite a lot of nobles early on in his campaign. That's plus, uh, that's four nobles in total that you can get pretty early on in his campaign because you obviously start with one hero capacity for nobles. You add plus three and you can recruit them in all provinces. So you don't even need the building, then armor, various other benefits as well. I'd say playing Emmerich's campaign is worth it just to experience what it's like to constantly be nuked by Drazov over here, and then having to deal with uh, Tretch, and then eventually encountering Mr. Grimgor all the way to the north. <laughs> is a very interesting campaign experience, all things concerned. You're sandwiched between Skaven, you've got the Chaos Dwarves, you've got Gorst. You've got a lot of things on your plate in this particular campaign. And the thing is, you may be able to deal with all of those things because you're playing one of the most powerful races in the game. I mean, granted, due to the lack of trade partners, it is going to be an issue to get going. And... It's not the best campaign for necessarily the. Uh, it's not the best high elven campaign when it comes to repeat playthroughs. But just experiencing Emric once is certainly a worthwhile experience from my perspective. And number four is Durfu. Now I don't think very highly about the Wood Elves, but playing a Wood Elf campaign at least once is certainly going to be worth it. And I think overall the best Wood Elf campaign is certainly uh, Durfu. Or the Sisters of Twilight, if you want to get it cheaper and also get Frat on clean as a Legion Lord for a Skaven, yeah, you can get the Sisters of Twilight DLC. They also work. Durfu just has the highest potential of the Wood Elves because he can confederate all the other Legion Lords of the Wood Elves without, um, for events, without having uh, to go for the hassle of diplomacy. I mean, diplomatically, I think it's possible for all of them to do it, but it can also be something of an issue. Now, what's nice about Durfu, well, he's got a lot of things going for him. Uh, he gets Wall Breaker for Tree Men and um, Ancient Tree Men. So basically, you can recruit an Ancient Tree Men as a lord to your army, and he can bust down the walls of enemy forts. You'll also get, um, hilariously, you also get a Lord Recruit rank benefit that isn't actually mentioned as a campaign benefit over here. It is a bit hilarious. So yeah, Durfu is insanely powerful. The reason he's so powerful is those ancient tree men give you 20% ward save for tree kin. And as Durfu, you can recruit those tree kin at tier 2. 
as opposed to tier 3, which does apply to Orion and the Sisters of Twilight. And while you don't start with the tier 2 Salmon like, say, Draika, yes, she is absolutely insane, while you don't start with the tier 2 Salmon, you certainly do start in a pretty good position. You might have to manually fight the initial battles over here against Karak Norn and uh, the Grimhold, but you certainly have all the tools you needed to succeed in this particular campaign. I mean, the Wood Elves are a powerful race. And I think just experiencing the Wood Elf Treekin um, tree campaign playstyle at least once in Total War Warhammer 3 is absolutely worth it. You will devastate everything and everyone in your path. It's not a hard campaign at all. You, and you will teleport around the world. But it is, and it can be fun, really, just once or twice to play the Wood Elf campaign, devastate your opponents, take them out. My recommendation, make your way towards Drakenhof, pay Vlad a visit, because guess what? If you take Drakenhof, you can actually benefit quite a bit from this particular settlement uh, as the Wood Elves. You could benefit before from taking Altdorf, that's no longer the case, but if you take Drakenhof, and build a settlement, you can benefit a lot from it. And then teleport over here to Grand Cafe, pick a fight with one of the minor cafe and factions, and get access to the spirits here, once you get the quest to be able to confederate with them. Again, it's not necessarily the best campaign in the world, but it is a campaign that can be fun for a couple of times, at least once, highly recommended. And number three it is Bellacore. Now, whilst I certainly think that the Warriors of Chaos can be pretty boring on repeated playthroughs, I would certainly argue that Bellacore is worth playing at least once in Immortal Empires. It is, in a lot of ways, a fun campaign with fun mechanics. You can teleport around the world using the portals you can set up with Bellacore. You do start with one in the certain cast ways, and you do start with one in the Ostermark. So hey, you can even have a quote-unquote challenging campaign by picking a fight with Draika early on, if you so desire. It is also a faction that allows you to really utilize the demons more effectively of the Warriors of Chaos, because you get access to all of the Chaos Gods from the very start. You have their gifts unlocked, or one gift for every Chaos God unlocked from the very start of your campaign. And also, since you're undivided, you also start with a Hell Cannon, which is always a fun experience to have in your campaigns. So there's quite a few things on offer over here to Belakor. Unfortunately, he is still a Warriors of Chaos Lingering Lord, so that does detract from playing his campaign again and again. But the mechanics of the campaign, the Legendary Lord himself, they're actually fairly solid. Belakor himself gets uh, quite a bit of damage resistance, authority with undivided units, Lord the Torment, um, a bunch of corruption with all the Chaos Gods and even more authority. Uh, experience gain for Undivided Lords and Heroes, Leadership, Warband Upgrade Cost, minus 75%. He can also take the Blood Letters and upgrade them. Now, I don't think using the Plague Bearers or the Demonets or the Pink Horrors is worth it, but I certainly do believe, um, I, I certainly do believe that playing his campaign at least once is certainly a worthwhile experience in the game. Once. Probably not more than that, though, I would argue. I think the best path of this campaign is to head over here to Norska, vassalize Wolfric, gain another Dark Fortress for the Doomkeep, another one for the Monolith over here, and then go north and pick a fight with Sigvald, and then teach, uh, and then go conquer Ulfwan in the campaign, because that's what you need to do in order to win this particular campaign. But you do have a lot more flexibility than that. You can go and conquer all of the Empire and vassalize the Empire. You can confederate every other Legion Lord of the Warriors of Chaos. So you can teach Archeon and the others who is the true ever-chosen of the Gods of Chaos. And number two is Nakari. Now, Nakari isn't necessarily the best campaign to play in a very, very long one, because it can get pretty tedious to do so. Nor is it necessarily a campaign you would want to play more than once. But that one time you do play Nakari and experience the joys of having to conquer Wolf One as him, her, it, they, whatever it is, 
can be a really fun and interesting experience. It is a fairly brutal situation, I'm not going to lie to you. It is pretty brutal in a lot of ways because you do have two armies over here in Crace, and you do have a provincial capital and the garrison over here to deal with. So that can be a pretty brutal start, and that's just the start. If you're playing on a high difficulty, this campaign, I would, I would argue, can have one of the most brutal campaign starts in the entire game. You can make it work. You can make it work very well in point of fact and then vassalize all the other legendary lords over here in Wolf 1 and that gives you a ridiculous amount of campaign power. Uh, Nakari is certainly interesting to experience once because of the various mechanics. It's unfortunate that Slanesh itself is not really a great, fac a great faction, great race. The unit roster has a lot of issues, especially against the High Elves who are kind of designed in a lot of ways to counter you, especially in siege battles. Besieging High Elven settlements is a brutal affair. Field battles, that's a different discussion. Because of your devastating flanker ability, you can absolutely roll over the High Elves because of all the charge bonuses that you get. So you have units that are generally well suited for charging and then you add devastating flanker which doubles that if you're managing to get good uh, flanking attacks then yeah you get a lot of power in field battles unfortunately you do have poor replenishment and once you do take over all of wolf one it does uh it does uh, stop being a very interesting campaign but just having to deal with Elfarian, alarial and terrian as nakari can be a pre brutal experience but it also can be really fun to succeed as nakari can feel really um really great to experience that at least once in your total war uh, immortal empires experiences in general one is oxyatl now you can certainly play this campaign multiple times and enjoy it because it, there is a great deal of flexibility in this particular campaign due to the teleportation mechanic so how does Oxyato work? He's focused on the skirmisher units of the Lizardmen. So you're focused on Chameleon Stalkers and Chameleon Skinks in particular. You have faction-wide benefits to reduce the upkeep and improve those units as they level up during the course of your campaign. You start with two heroes because you have one starting one, an Oracle over here, and you can get another one through the unit recruitment building that you start with at tier 2. Now, this campaign is a great deal of fun, not because of where you started or what you're having to deal with in this initial starting situation, but rather of what happens later down the line. Oxyatl is going to get all of these missions through the visions of the old ones. And these are missions that are going to require you to teleport around the campaign map and deal with various uh, foes throughout the course of your campaign. And that is a really fun experience as you get to encounter a lot of different races and a lot of different challenges throughout the course of the campaign. It is not necessarily fun to deal with the Doomstack that the AI just pawns to deal with you, but it is fun to just, you know, show up and take Archeon's capital, for instance, as an example, or show up to beat up Vlad, though good luck with that, Vlad is insanely powerful on the campaign at the moment, but you can certainly succeed as Oxyontal. What's even more interesting, I would argue, is what you're going to get. You're going to get various rewards, money, uh, growth, etc. for doing these missions. But you're also going to get Blessed Spawnings. Blessed Spawnings are kind of like Regiments of Renown, but not really Regiments of Renown. Uh, they're basically rewards for missions you get during the course of a Lizardman campaign. And Oxyatl gets far more of these than any other Lizardman Ledger and Lord, which does give you a huge amount of power on the campaign map. It's certainly on the easier side of campaigns, but you're probably gonna end up having to fight quite a few battles manually because these skanks are not necessarily the best units when it comes to auto resolve. And you're having to do things at the same time. One, you're having to expand over here in the south to eventually deal with Kairos Fate Weaver, who is certainly going to be a foreign in your backside if you ignore him. And you also have to teleport Oxyatl's main army around, build uh, hidden uh, silent sa sanctums using the gems. And one of those silent sanctums can be used as a teleportation location. So let's say you just want to help out Kislev and the Empire. Well, just put one in the northern chaos waste and teleport there when you have the opportunity to do so to weaken the forces of chaos. In particular, bully Archeon, so to speak. Or you can teleport to Athaloran and pick a fight with all of the Wood Elves or help the Wood Elves if you so 
desire. There's a lot of choices and flexibility in this campaign. You're not tied to any particular bit of territory. Every climate type is available in this campaign. It is incredibly flexible and you don't suffer diplomatic penalties for trespassing with Oxyatl's army. If he had a stock chance, I'd say it would be even better, but the way the campaign currently works, it certainly, uh, it, it certainly makes it a great campaign to uh to experience once <laughs> at least once um when you're playing warhammer free and i'm not sure why the game is lagging here but yeah there's just a bunch of performance with toggle fog of war uh, right now or performance issues on the campaign map i would say but it is a fun and interesting campaign i mean consider this your your starting foe is a blood firster that should give you an idea of what you're going to be dealing with during this campaign. That The fact that this is your starting foe and you're just going to walk all over him. With relative ease, actually. And you're going to be walking over a lot of powerful Legendary Lords for the course of this campaign. I think it would be interesting if AI Oxyatl actually could do the same things, like teleport around the map and just show up to cause havoc if you're playing a, you know, a faction of this order like Chaos, for instance, or Vampire Counts, certainly would spice things up. It, especially for Warriors of Chaos, I would certainly say they could use that at the moment in the game. Um, but unfortunately, Axiatl yeah, doesn't do that. He just spends his entire campaign fighting the Southern Castways and eventually losing to AI Kairos because, well, just auto resolve being auto resolve. Anyway, that's it. Questine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.